The night was so cloudy and dark that I could hardly see my own fingers. The sea was calm, not a breeze. The heads of the boys seemed like little black dots on the smooth surface of the water. Six hundred black dots stretched out in a long line. The blacker the better, I thought. We were to sail without diving as long as possible to save air tanks in case of trouble near shore. Barbed wire or mines could create additional difficulties, so it was decided that Willie, Wolf and I would go first. The squad was to wait for our signal and, having landed, split into two groups, one to hide the equipment and the other to comb the beach. I gave the command and the three of us went ashore. Luck was smiling on us again. The area wasn't mined, there was no barbed wire, and we passed this first section with ease, almost as I had anticipated. I had signalled to Willie that I would go first, so he and Wolf hid between the concrete pillars used to moor the barge. But I knew they were watching me and recording my every move. Our three submersibles were safely hidden underwater, and I crawled like a snake along the shore. My heart was pounding frantically in my chest, and my eyes were straining to catch any movement on the beach. It was completely dark, as dark as the eye could see. When I reached the beach, I could feel every muscle in my body shaking. I quickly took off my diving suit and, taking my shoelaces out of my bag, wrapped them around my feet and slipped into the boots that Russian army officers wore. Then I took out my belt, pistol, binoculars and several bottles of vodka and transferred it all into my backpack. Despite the fact that I acted as quickly as possible, the change of clothes took me about five minutes, but no one interfered or even caught me on the road during that time. And only two metres away from me, I saw Willie doing the same thing. After waiting for everyone to change, I buried the underwater suits and bags deep in the sand and, checking to see if anything was left on the ground, pulled out an uncorked bottle of vodka. Rinse your mouth and spit out the rest, but make sure you spill a little on the uniform. We'll pretend to be drunk and check it out like that. With both arms around my shoulders so that I was in the middle, we moved forward. Let's go see if this beach is guarded or not. We were beyond suspicion this way, but I knew that 600 people were waiting, sitting in the water, shivering, but not from the cold, but from the tension. Talking loudly, sometimes breaking into drunken yells, laughing and inserting foul language, we dragged ourselves slowly along the beach, trying to keep more or less parallel to the sea line. A little while later, I told the boys that we should sing. Then the Coast Guard would definitely hear us if they even existed. So the louder we sing, the better. We sang Katyusha, and not thirty seconds later a rough voice shouted in Russian, Stop! Who's coming? We stopped, and I shouted with all my might, Password! Blue Sea! It worked! If someone had told me that, I would never have believed it. We continued singing. Stepping carefully, a Russian guard approached us. As he approached and examined his uniform, he spoke quickly. Hello, comrade senior lieutenant. Greetings, soldier, I replied. He smiled and relaxed. You know, at one point I thought, what if one of the Germans landed on the shore? But then I realised that there was no way they could have come without ships. He was silent, waiting for our reaction, whether we would laugh or not. So Willie clapped Wolf on the back and shouted, How clever you are! And we all laughed. The Germans don't even have any ships, I said. And if they do, we'll point our guns at them, because we've seen them here, and we'll drive them from here all the way to Berlin. Not thinking long, I decided to turn the conversation to another topic and asked, I don't see any guards yet. Have they been alerted? Oh, they may be on the other side of the shore. Because of the noise of the sea you can hardly reach them, and it's a long way away, so it's almost impossible to see anyone from here. How far apart are the posts? Every three hundred metres. And where is the command post? I asked a question, not expressing any particular interest. He waved his hand nonchalantly in the southern direction. One kilometre from here. Great, I thought. A whole division could pass through here. I offered him a drink and filled his mug from an unopened bottle. He swallowed the vodka as if it were water. 
Let's go see how your partner is doing, I suggested. He gladly agreed. We moved forward, and halfway there we spotted him. Ivan called him our friend. Yes? Come here. When he approached, our friend introduced me as Senior Lieutenant Kirillov. From Vitebsk, he added. Ivan smiled happily. My house is twenty kilometres from there. So let's drink to that, I could only reply. The guard impatiently snatched the mug from my hand and swished the vodka. They drank it like water. I filled the mugs again, and this time they barely had time to swallow the contents before they immediately passed out. Continuing to speak Russian as if nothing had happened, I took out a cigarette, lit it, and flicked it on, keeping the match burning as well. To the careless guards, this sign would have said nothing. Without wasting time, Willie rushed to the water to meet the six hundred men who were already swimming toward him at top speed. I decided to send Lieutenant Wolf to help Willie, to give the boys instructions in case Willie missed anything. You got seven minutes. The submersibles need to be hidden deep enough so they don't get washed ashore by the tide. Wolf rushed off to do his job and disappeared into the night. I remained standing near the guards, thinking over every detail of what to do next. It seemed to me that I had a loudspeaker inserted into my brain which continuously repeats the same thing. Remember, your task is to destroy all communication centres. This is the most important. Eliminate communication first. The main thing is to leave them without communication, and the longer they do not come to their senses, the better not only for you, but for the entire German army. In this way you will save thousands of lives. We are several times less than the Russians, so we must act precisely. The people and the Führer will be waiting for the successful completion of the operation. Then Willie showed up. Everyone is changed and ready. All but the essential equipment is safely hidden. I nodded. The guards were unconscious as they were, but should be recovering soon, so I told Willie to lift one while I busied myself with the other and hold it upright. As we lifted the soldiers to their feet, their bodies collapsed helplessly on our shoulders. It worked, and they began to regain consciousness almost immediately. Ivan muttered something like, This drunkenness will do no good. The one I was holding also regained consciousness. I again poured vodka into mugs and handed it to them, and to my amazement they did not refuse, even in their condition. When they returned the mugs, Willie and I also drank to success. But to whose success we were silent. Then, turning to the guards, I said, Don't raise the alarm if you hear any noise. My battalion is down on the beach now and they will be here soon. Barely uttering this sentence, I heard a noise, and a few seconds later Wolf appeared ahead of the marching band, leading it straight to where we were standing. Giving the command to stand, Willie came up to me and reported, 77th Coast Artillery Regiment has arrived on the spot. Permission to proceed, Comrade Senior Lieutenant. To confuse the guards, I ordered him to take the men to the hills not far from here and leave them there for a couple of hours. Then, turning to the Russians, we talked about how much death war brings. When the last of the squad had passed, I gradually brought the conversation to a close and after saying goodbye, Willie and I withdrew. There was no need to worry about the guards reporting us, for they were afraid of punishment if they were caught drunk on duty. They could end up in a penal battalion or in the front line, and every Russian knew perfectly well what those words meant, and those who tried to escape were shot, or they were blown up in the territory mined by the Germans. Those who tried to still pass through the minefield were shot at by German infantry. So any attempt to escape ended in one thing, death. After running through all these reasons in my head, I could be sure that we would not be bailed out. We had studied too long and now knew more than well the system of the Russian army. The ordinary soldier had practically no rights. An officer could take off his belt and whip him to a pulp without listening to the guilty man's excuses. Walking along the shore, we came to a level road running between the bay and the forest. I ordered to allocate a man from each squad, who would be at a distance of fifty metres from the rest and listen to any suspicious sound and closely observe the surrounding area. 
In case any movement was noticed, they were to report to me immediately. I then gave the boys final instructions. The first squad is immediately sent towards the railroad tracks in order to blow up the bridges and further, to destroy all living things in its path. You know what to do next. The second detachment is sent under the guise of military police to bring confusion and misinformation to the regiments and to send army detachments in the wrong directions. Replace signboards by painting new ones. In short, to do whatever was necessary. Unit number three. Remember everything you've been taught. Your job is to listen to the equipment and to know where the troops are going. Fenrich Vogel, you're very good at impersonating voices. So, when the main communication centre will be destroyed, immediately distribute new orders to divisions. What to do then? I do not think it is necessary to repeat. The first squad divided into three and left in formation, marching across fields and along rivers, using the available map as a guide. Squad number two, also divided into three sub-squads, went to fulfil their mission, which was to destroy fuel and weapons depots. The third, having disbanded into groups of nine men, was left to take control of all roads. All telephone wires leading to and from Odessa had to be cut without exception, and quickly. There was still a fourth detachment left, and it was to do the most important work. For this reason, Willie and I stayed with him. We discussed a plan of further action, which was that, having reached the harbour, we would divide and with an incomplete detachment openly enter the gate. Willie will give orders for both parts of the detachment. The job of the split-offs is to mislead everyone, to fool everyone. Don't forget the pills in case they fail. Your job is to knock out the switchboard and then the two radios. You can disable them in any way you want if you realise that you have coped with the task. You can move to the army headquarters. Once safely into the city, you can be on your own. I'll join the rest of the boys from squad number one at the harbour master's camp. One of us will keep in touch with you at all times. Is that clear? There were no questions and we formed into lines and separated. Without stopping and without talking, we walked down the road to the city and sang amicably. Odessa was literally swarming with military men. Hundreds, thousands of Russian infantrymen were moving in different directions. Transport columns were slowly rolling along the sides of the road. There were tanks, artillery and everything that was on wheels and could move. The roads were jammed and I noticed with satisfaction that the Russians were panicking. There was only one small German detachment among the enemy's army of many thousands. The dawn dawning heralded a good, clear day. Approaching the harbour, Willie shouted in the purest Russian language with impeccable pronunciation, Squad, halt, one, two. The third squad, go on a mission. Junior Lieutenant Gritz accepted the command and led the squad through the gate. The sentries saluted. The backpacks behind the guys' backs were stuffed with explosives. There were also underwater suits that didn't fit completely and were visible to anyone. But we didn't worry about that. The sentries had already received false orders, ostensibly from General Zhukov, to let the detachment through without delay, and no officer would dare to violate the order, signed by the general himself, and sealed. It took our handwriting experts years to do their job perfectly. According to the documents, the boys were sent for underwater exercises, and General Zhukov personally signed the order to the harbour authorities to allocate barracks for us, and instructed the management to provide us with facilities for training. According to the legend, the detachment was a team preparing to conduct underwater sabotage operations, but not subordinate to the Navy and therefore independent of the Naval Command. As soon as we entered the gate, Willie shouted, Georg, go shake up those homeland sentries a bit. Ask them how dare they let a squad through without checking their papers. I looked at Willie, once again marvelling at his recklessness. At the same time, his head was working 24 hours a day, calculating all possible options. Quickly I realised what he meant. I had to check in unobtrusively with the harbour master. The sooner they got used to us, the better. So I approached the sergeant standing guard at the gate and asked, How long have you been in the army? Six years. And in all that time, 
You've never once bothered to read the poster that hangs on the wall in every headquarters? Don't you know you're supposed to check everyone who comes in? I got so angry I started yelling. The sergeant stood in front of me like a dumbfounded man, not knowing what to say. Then I saw him look at someone behind me, and then I heard a voice. What's going on here? It sounded quite calm. Turning quickly, I saw a tall man with blonde hair and a Slavic-type face, wearing a blue-coloured uniform. He had the rank of Major in the Soviet Navy and was the assistant to the port chief. After saluting, I explained the situation. I sent a detachment into the harbour, but the guards didn't even bother to check those entering. At my remark, the Major waved his hand in the direction. Squads in their mass do not stop. We can only check on individuals. Oh, in that case, Sergeant, I apologise. You too, Major. It wasn't difficult for me to apologise once again. The important thing is that I got the result I wanted. By the way, what was the purpose of your unit came to the harbour? asked the Major. Instead of answering, I handed him the order of General Zhukov. After reading it, he raised a flushed face at me. We are honoured to have you here, Senior Lieutenant. His embarrassment was not fake. He was the first, maybe the only one, in the entire port to bother to find out who we were. But he'd forgotten to return his papers and it was inappropriate to ask for them back at this point. Slipping them into the breast pocket of his jacket, he said clearly, It's all right. Now we need to take a look at your squad. First he checked the two squads standing outside the gate. I walked beside him, not knowing whether to cry or laugh. Out of the corner of my eye I noticed Willie, shuffling from foot to foot, nervous that he'd overreached since luck was always smiling on us. But as always, he kept his cool. Once the inspection was complete, we entered the harbour. By the way, where are you from? the Major inquired. I answered the first thing that came to mind. From Vitebsk. Apparently, what the psychiatrists taught us during the academy training worked. He stopped abruptly grabbed me and started shaking my hand, clapping me on the shoulder with the other. Brother, I lived there for a long time, and what neighbourhood are you from? Civil Street. What? he exclaimed. I lived there too in house number seven. There was nowhere to wait for help. I had to keep playing the part, so I added, I lived across the street, in the ninth house. You're not by any chance the son of a full-figured woman, Kirillov, Grigory, he shouted. Yes, that's me. My words did not sound quite convincing. He was amazed. And I remember you perfectly well. You know you haven't changed a bit. He was still staring at me in amazement, and I tried to brace myself, feeling the heat rising inside me. I was forced to get used to the idea that I was Grigory Kirillov, but how to live with it, not taught. The only thing I knew was that when they matched our personalities to certain names, they looked for people whose appearance, height and all the parameters coincided with ours as much as possible. And thank God. Here for the first time I felt awe of my teachers. Now everything that had been hammered into us for so long could come in handy. The Major was still shaking his head. Don't you remember me? He asked, impatient for an answer. He was delighted with his discovery and so, fortunately, he didn't wait for an answer. I had no idea who he was. Wait a minute, he said quickly. The first time I saw you was when you were coming home from school. I also tripped you, remember. Really, that was about seven or eight years ago. He was silent now, waiting to hear the answer. I still didn't know his name, and then I heard the guard's voice shouting to him, Major Kalosha. I immediately took a decisive step and said, You can't be Kalosha. I hoped my words sounded natural. Yes, he shouted. Yes, brother, yes. I was on the right track. Without even trying to look in Willie's direction for fear of losing my way, I opened the small leather bag and pulled out the pictures, showing him my father and mother. He had never seen my father because he had died in the revolution, but he recognised my mother, a full-figured, good-natured woman, immediately. The Major took the pictures from me. She's still the same, you know, a really kind woman. Whenever I approached her, she never refused and always gave me bread or butter. You always made jam in your house. Next, 
I took out a picture of my girlfriend. Do you remember her? Nadia? Of course. Of course I remember her very well. He laughed and shook his head. I liked her for a long time. But she was much younger, though she was already running around with the other boys. She must have been a year or two older than you. I wasn't sure, so I gave a vague answer, something like, whatever. He was so engrossed in the conversation that he completely forgot to finish the unit. So happy was our unexpected meeting for him. He had gone to serve in the Navy right from his house number seven. He talked for 15 minutes about Vitebsk, about the people who lived there, asking me questions, to which I answered with all my wits, sometimes vaguely, sometimes clearly. He was so impressed that when I tried to change the topic of conversation to another direction, or rather to talk about the war, he did not react and continued talking, patting me now and then on one shoulder and then on the other. I told Gritz to read the order, but he only skimmed the lines and slipped it back into his pocket. There was not a shadow of doubt in his mind. I will give you the finest quarters that there are in all Russia, he exclaimed. We have a whole wing of empty barracks. No one will disturb you there, and you can do whatever you like. Just make sure you don't blow up everything, but leave something behind, he joked, referring to our loud laughter. He led us to the barracks, also showing us where our kitchen was. The mess halls are now open 24 hours a day. You can come in at any time and eat. They make mostly borscht and rasolniki for the first course. That's good, I said. I had just worked up a wolfish appetite. He still hadn't read the order, and it was still in his pocket, so I was worried whether he was going to give it back or not. After we looked at our rooms, he walked me through the staffs and introduced me to the harbour master, proudly mentioning how he used to trip me up when I was a kid. Look at him now, and you wouldn't believe he was once a regular tomboy. But the chief was too busy to listen to any more stories about our childhood, so Major Kalosha took me to his office to write out passes for all the other guys. As he took out the papers, he seemed surprised to have them in his pocket. At least this time he'd give them back to me. Here, I don't need them. Just keep the lists with the names on them. Better keep the orders until you're done with the drill. Though he had already returned the documents, he seemed to have completely forgotten about the two squads waiting outside the gate. I could only imagine how Willie would react when he heard about this story. It wasn't really a big deal. Units and sometimes whole battalions of the Russian army could wait for days for the return of their commanders. Kalosha started talking again, pointing to my chair with an apologetic look, but I said I couldn't stay. I'm sorry, but I have to. I still have to deploy my squads. Grigory, I have a surprise for you tonight. I've been living here for a while in one of the staff houses, and we're meeting there tonight. And the surprise is that my wife will be there. I'm sure you know her, I asked, not really hoping to know who she was, but he just smiled enigmatically. You'll see for yourself later. Thanking him, I left and walked quickly toward the harbour gate. Willie looked at me. Georg, what the hell? You and him were walking all over the harbour and cooing like a couple of lovebirds. Do you want to know why, Willie? I muttered. Because Major Kalosha and I went to school together. He's very proud of those years. But I'll tell you, I'm even more proud that I didn't get cracked. We both laughed. We marched in formation into the heart of the city, heading for a park just across the street from the Odessa Communications Centre, the same one we had studied thoroughly from the movie and where I intended to leave my second unit. They broke away from us at the far end of the park and turned in the opposite direction. Now came the most important moment for them. They carried with them the orders they had received in Germany, and nothing more serious now existed. They were all experts in radio and telephones, and experts in misleading anyone. We watched them for a long time as they walked through the park, knowing that it might be the last time we saw them alive, and then we turned back to the harbour. All the way back, I was tormented by one thought. Who is Kalosha's wife? And what will her reaction be when she sees me? What if we were in love as children? Of course, she was the girl Kalosha was no doubt sure of. That's for sure. We need to come up with some kind of plan, but what kind? 
If I can't figure this situation out, then at least the unit can pack up and go home now. Well, who would have thought that in such a huge country like Russia, I would meet someone who happened to know the real Grigory Kirillov? And it was from Vitebsk. And then there's this wife, as it happens. Sighing heavily, I returned with the rest of the squad to the harbour. Coming out of the barracks, Willie and I went straight to the mess hall, leading our own. Our stomachs were demanding food. We walked up to the square window where the food was dispensed. I expected to see a fat sergeant looking out of the window, but I was wrong. In the window was a young girl, maybe a little older than me, but still a girl, dark-haired, with big brown eyes, and even so inexperienced a fool as myself noticed at once how well-built she was. I was speechless and stood there staring at her. She looked back, and I felt the colour flood my face. A minute seemed like an eternity, and we stood staring at each other, not taking our eyes off each other. Then she smiled weakly at me, and I smiled back, feeling the tension subside. Overpowering myself, I spoke. I'm hungry as a wolf. The voice sounded nothing like mine. This time she smiled genuinely, showing beautiful white teeth. Without saying a word, she turned away for half a minute, and when she turned back, she was holding a full plate of potatoes and meat with gravy. Are you new here? she asked. Just arrived, I answered, looking at the food. I'll come by at three o'clock. If you want, we can walk around and I'll show you the harbour. I looked at her a little surprised. I'd have to work up the courage for three weeks to offer her the same thing. Oh, that would be nice. But despite the sympathy I'd generated, I was already pursuing a personal agenda, planning to get her to talk about Colosi's wife. Surely they knew each other and that conversation might help me. She treated Willie less kindly. Holding out a plate of food, she barely glanced in his direction. As I left, the girl winked at me and turned back to her work. Willie was indignant. Georg, although I feel very bad, I still forgive you. We sat down. OK, I'll give you some tips on how to treat a girl. Willie, I've known you for over three years and I was wondering when you became an experienced lover. Well, it's not that complicated. I just know a little more than you do about these things. You see, some people are born with it. Now, listen carefully. Wait for her at the back entrance to the kitchen and when she comes out, you can talk to her. All you need to say is how wonderful, extraordinary, beautiful, enchanting and so on she is. Then, when you've been walking for half an hour, take her hand and squeeze it gently, but don't do it again. From there, just keep walking. Listening to him was a pleasure. After a little while, when she gets used to you, you take your time and put your arm around her waist, but keep walking without stopping. Just lead her to a place where there will be no extra eyes, no one to disturb you. Then stop and look into her face, look straight into her eyes with a long stare, and then smile gently and kiss her. But you don't just kiss her, you have to hug her too. By the time Willie finished his story, my plate was empty. I'd been spooning so fast that before I knew it, I'd eaten it all. I looked at him curiously. Willie, I know that in three years you haven't had a chance to date or meet girls. So how do you know all these things? You're not telling me you haven't heard of any of this stuff, are you? I blushed and nodded. He laughed and then admitted that he'd just read love novels that described it all. Now that made me laugh. I didn't realise you had time for that. He replied with his mouth full. Try reading them sometime, Georg. You'll see. You'll like them too. I glanced at my watch. It was ten minutes past three and a whole fifty minutes had to be killed somehow. While we were sitting there trying to fill the time, a boy from the third squad came in and told me that Major Kalosha had sent a car for me. Willie immediately knew how to proceed. He suggested we go and see what the other squads were doing. I approved his suggestion. The sooner the liaison squad could give information to the others, the better. When the guy left, I couldn't get rid of the thought. Today we are alive and tomorrow we can be killed, so we should enjoy life here and now, though it didn't usually cross my mind. Ten to three. Now I was really starting to get nervous. I hadn't been able to stay in the kitchen for the last 15 minutes, so I'd been running back and forth. 
I had even forgotten about Kalosha's wife. I was thinking about what Willie had told me, and I was already imagining squeezing her hand and kissing her a thousand times. The thoughts were running themselves, and I couldn't stop them even if I wanted to. What's wrong with me? I asked myself. I'd never been kissed before, and the fate of the whole squad depends on this date. Conflicting thoughts rushed through my head, and my mind didn't agree with my feelings. She came out of the kitchen door, smiling at me, and extended her hand. By the way, my name is Marussia. And you? Grigory. What a beautiful name. She took me under her arm, and we walked. In the next half an hour we exchanged literally a few words, and I began to think how to get to the point, or rather, how to put my arm around her waist. We went to the farthest end of the harbour, and it felt like Willie wasn't giving advice to me, but to Marusa, because she was leading me in the right direction. I was completely subdued and was preparing to make a decisive step when she stopped. Grigori, you're blushing so much. Didn't you have a girlfriend back home? No, I answered without thinking. After all, Georg von Konrath really didn't have a girlfriend. But then I realised that anyone in my place, even if he had a wife with six children, would have said the same thing, and so I relaxed. It was a mistake that could have been easily corrected. You're so different from other men, she continued dreamily. They're all about getting a girl in their arms and kissing her. You're the first one who doesn't act like that, and that's why I like you. I smirked. To hell with Willie and his instructions. They're just words written on paper. And from now on, I'm going to be myself, or as much as Kirillov will let me. We both felt a little more confident now, and I unobtrusively inquired if she knew Kalosha's wife. It turned out that she did, and very well, very carefully so that she wouldn't see the catch, I began to question her. What's her name? Nina. That was something. At least now, when I ran into her, I could exclaim joyfully, Nina, you're the one I never expected to see here, or something like that. Then another thought occurred to me. I had no idea what she looked like, so I asked, Does she look good? Well, Marussia shrugged her shoulders and started to speak, but then she hesitated. Wait, why do you ask? Maybe you're going to hit on her. Not knowing women at all, I made a rashness, asking such a question. I think Marussia was getting angry. Oh, Marussia, I exclaimed, stirred. You have misunderstood everything. I asked only because we are from the same city. She relaxed. No way, that's great. Her voice sounded different now. Why don't we come over for a cup of tea? I'll introduce you. She's my best friend. I couldn't help but latch on to the opportunity. We headed for the Major's house, and the rest of the way she talked incessantly about Nina. I didn't try to interrupt her. I wondered if Nina was as talkative. When we reached the house, Marussia opened the door without knocking. Nina! A voice came from somewhere in the back of the house and allowed us to enter. The hallway turned out to be very cosy and meticulously cleaned although everything here was extremely simple. But then, under the communist system, there were no rich houses in Russia. A woman of striking beauty entered the room, dark brown loose hair thrown back over her shoulders. She was a little overweight. For a moment we looked at each other as if we had known each other before, and then Marussia said, Nina, meet my new friend Grigory. He came from the same town as you. Nina wasn't stupid at all. She just looked at me and smiled weakly. Grigori? Grigori? And by your last name? Marussia giggled. Kirillov. Nina immediately tensed, and I noticed how red her face. Then she stretched out her arms and, enclosing me in her embrace, kissed me directly on the lips. If you hadn't told me who he was, I never would have found out myself. She took a step back and looked me over again, from head to toe. You're a real man now. Do you know my husband? Kalosha? Of course, I answered. Everything was going well so far. Now I just had to play my part, but I had no idea how to make it so that I could be alone with Nina and find out what kind of relationship she had with Kirillov. 
Judging by the way she kissed me, I had already realised that it was not accidental. Without hiding my admiration, I looked at her. Of course, no one could have looked at her any other way. Something could have happened between us, and I was even almost ready for it, but I didn't want to come between her and her husband. That was not at all why we had come to Odessa. Nina set the table and made tea. I drank from my glass, giving the women the opportunity to talk, and answered only when they asked me something. Marussia took my behaviour quite naturally, since she thought I was shy, but Nina seemed to have other reasons, and I needed to find out what they were. But in order to make sense of it all, I needed to get rid of Marusi. Thinking about it, I refused the second glass of tea offered by Nina, saying that it was time for me to return to the detachment. Marusia immediately asked, I'll see you again, won't I? Sure, maybe even tonight, here. I looked at Nina and she nodded. Then I said goodbye and walked away so that, being hidden, I could watch the people passing around the house. After walking a hundred metres, I hid in the trees and watched the house, waiting for Marussia to leave. Fifteen minutes later I saw her come out and walk in the opposite direction. As soon as she was out of sight, I returned to the house, this time knocking on the door. Nina responded immediately, and upon entering I found her in the kitchen. Before I left, I put my notebook on a chair in the hallway so I could use that as an excuse to come back later. I'm sorry, Nina, but I forgot my notebook. It must have fallen out while we were talking. We started looking for it and found it almost immediately where I'd left it. Anyway, I added, there's nothing important in it. Nina smiled and brought more tea. Listen, why don't I pour you some vodka? she asked. Not having time, I thanked her and refused. I had to find out everything about Nina before the Major came back and found me here. I drank my tea in small sips, waiting for Nina to start the conversation first. As I had hoped, this wise woman was the first to talk about the past. And you, Grigory, were a real little devil, she giggled. Remember how you took me to the rye field? I blurted, guessing what she meant. It was more what I'd expected. Nina smiled, looking at me, and I quickly asked, Does Kalosha know? Why, of course not, she whispered. He's so jealous. How good it is that you met Marussia. Otherwise he might have guessed everything. I nodded in agreement. Today Marussia was sent to me by God himself. Before I knew it, Nina was sitting on my lap. Grigori, all those years that I lived with Kalosha, I remembered about you. Wrapping her arms around my neck, she began to cover my face with kisses. Naturally, I liked it, but it was getting too complicated. I started to twist my head around, trying to get free and pull her away from me. Ah, Nina, I mumbled. As much as I'd like to stay, I have to go. But I'll see you tonight. See you tonight, then, she said, kissing my nose. I walked out of the house with a foggy head. Overwhelmed with emotion, I was half running, half stepping my way through the garden. Only persistent reminders to myself that I was an officer of the Red Army distinguished me at that moment from a bouncing two-year-old child. I threw a few pebbles across the street and entered my barracks. Today? God, today. Suddenly I realised the meaning of those words. The real trouble hadn't even started yet. How could I compete? Yes, just pretend, obviously already experienced in love affairs, Grigory. Georg boy, if you ever need help, it's now. I found Willie in the barracks, just back from inspecting our squads. Well, Georg, you're not the only genius around here. The liaison squad has found a whole house for themselves. They're all settled in and feeling like kings in a palace. You know, things are going well, at least for now. I hope it stays that way. The guys have already booby-trapped everything, and as they told me to tell you, tomorrow at midnight, their communication centre will go up so high that even Stalin, sitting in Moscow, will see the spectacle. If everything works properly, no one will know how it happened. Excellent. It will take the Russians a few days to re-establish communication and get the message back. But that won't be enough. What about the high-voltage line? We'll know by tomorrow at the appointed hour. Our communications team has already done the work wherever it's needed. 
So far, we haven't had a chance to communicate with the other guys who are on the mission, but thanks to the car Kalosha so kindly provided us, we can keep in constant contact. I nodded, completely satisfied with the arrangement. Still, I was grateful to Major Kalosha for his involvement. He had made our task very easy. Evening was approaching, and it was already time to go to Nina's again, so I went to my room to clean my uniform and tidy up. The water was ice cold, but there was no other. I took a shower and then cleaned myself up for ten minutes in front of the mirror, combing my hair and trying to look as much like Kirillov as possible with my facial expression. Then I went to the Major's house. Nina had already opened the door and was waiting for me on the porch steps. Marusia was also here. Hello, Grigory, they said together. Nina took me under her left arm, and Marusia immediately picked me up on the right. What a life! I was accompanied by two beauties at once. Entering the spacious room, I saw the port chief, two colonels, several other officers, and also several women who were presumably military wives. Kalosha grabbed my hand, ignoring the two ladies walking beside me, and introduced me to everyone in the house. I heard the story again about how he used to tripping me as a child. Now look at him. You can't play games like that with him today. Kalosha made a grimace, and everyone in the room laughed. Nina came to me with a full glass of vodka, and Kalosha immediately snatched it out of her hands and handed it to me. Nina stepped aside, a little upset. Well, there was no surprise, Kalosha exclaimed. Perhaps it was for the best, though, otherwise you both would have died of shock. There was a rumble in the room. All right, said the Major. We must have a drink. I raised my glass and slowly looked around. Nina, Marussia and Kalosha looked at me eagerly. To victory and to love, I said. All three of them liked my toast very much. One of the colonels thought it was a quotation from Shakespeare and at once began to think of me as belonging to some literary society. I did not dispel his illusions. Nina started the gramophone and after a few patriotic songs had been played, she put on a waltz and looked at me. Apparently, her look meant that I was the first of the guests to be invited to dance. Again, I mentally thanked my teachers, this time for fiddling with me for long hours, but still teaching me to dance. I stepped out and bowed to Nina. With a jokingly ostentatious expression of surprise, she accepted my outstretched hand and we spun around. The room was large enough that even though there were several couples dancing, it was comfortable to move, except that Nina was too caught up in me, squeezing my hand tightly. My instructor held himself in the dance a little differently. Yeah, now you've turned into a real man. This phrase she repeated several times. From such her behaviour I did not feel quite comfortable. Marusia danced with the harbour master, but followed us without taking her eyes off, drilling Nina with an angry look. I sighed, knowing that the next dance I would have to dance with her. Willie's words echoed in my ears. Don't be like me, Georg. Then you'll certainly avoid a lot of difficulties. Watch out for women. They can bring so many problems you've never encountered before. Don't get involved with those topsy-turvy women. It looked like I was already starting to get into trouble that I wasn't looking for at all. The music stopped and I escorted Nina to where she was sitting, bowing again and kissing her fingertips. It was a tradition in Russia for officers to kiss the hands of the wives of their superiors as a sign of respect. But, as I realised, both Nina and Marusia took it quite differently. Marusi's eyes threw lightning bolts. The table was set in the corner of the room and was bursting with a variety of food. There was smoked ham, sliced sausage, fresh cucumbers and tomatoes, green onions, salad leaves and freshly baked dark rye bread. To the right was another table laden with vodka bottles, clearly more popular at the moment than the first. Soon after the music had finished, a soldier called by the Major came in to play the accordion. The soldier moved his chair to the edge of the table, and when a glass of vodka was poured for him, he knocked it over and immediately held it back for more. After that he began to play. A few chords sounded and he played a waltz, loudly, 
and very animatedly. I got up and walked towards Marusa. I walked and thought I should bow as low to Marusa as I did to Nina. Dancing with Marusa embarrassed me even more than with Nina. She squeezed my hand even harder, trying to be more assertive. I didn't know how to act, but unlike Nina, Marusia didn't say anything. It seemed to me this dance would never end. She stared intently at me with big brown eyes. She seemed to hypnotise me, and I could not get away from her gaze. I just hoped everyone in the room was too drunk to notice us. When the music finally stopped playing, I was happier than I'd ever been in my life. But Marussia didn't give up. Without letting go of my hand, she went to her chair and sat me down next to her. Now, after I had kissed Nina's hand, I was sure I should do the same. She really liked my noble gesture. Empty vodka bottles lay haphazardly on the floor, and the fun continued. Kalosha pulled the army song, Dig, 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 and everyone joined him. Marussia put her arm around my neck and pressed herself against me. I could see that Nina was looking at us, but one of the colonels was hanging around her, and she couldn't move away from him. I felt out of place, my head was a mess and a complete mess, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get rid of the chaos in my thoughts. But what pissed me off the most was that I had no idea how to control the situation. One thing I knew for sure. I couldn't belong to two women at the same time, much less in the same room. As soon as the accordionist played again, I got rid of Marusi and led Nina to dance, remembering that I had to be careful. Nina, I addressed her gently. You know, I only met Marusia this afternoon, and I know nothing about her at all. What about Marusia? She's a very ordinary tomboy. When she sees a new officer, she starts attacking him until she gets her way. Maybe she'll like some other officer after all. Nina heaved a sigh of relief. I have no idea, but I know she's not your type. Yes, that's true, I replied. But I try to behave honourably. I cannot push away the girl as if she is nothing at all. No, Grigory, of course you cannot do that. At the next dance, I took Marusia aside and explained to her the same thing I told Nina, that I must be nice to the mistress of the house. Marusia immediately agreed with me, and I added that Kalosha was an old friend of mine, and I would not want to do anything unkind to his wife. My explanation satisfied Marusia. For the rest of the evening, the girls no longer squinted at each other. The vodka disappeared with incredible speed. The colonel began to dance, performing a Cossack dance, and Kalosha climbed up on the table and danced on it, kicking his feet up high. The table creaked horribly, and bottles, crumpled cucumbers, and unaten sausage flew from it, pieces of breed fell, and the table hit the wall. But nobody cared. I took Marusia to dance the Cossack, and the colonel picked up Nina and, unable to hold on, fell on top of us. We knocked someone else down, and they knocked someone else down. Somewhere they fell, they stayed lying there. Somebody was kissing somebody. It was crazy, all mixed up, and I didn't understand a thing. Although I tried not to drink too much, I still felt that I was shaky. Some of the officers, drunk to the point of unconsciousness, had already fallen into the beds in the house, and those who were still on their feet did not care about me. The musician collapsed in a corner and only grunted, trying to say something. Kalosha himself collapsed on the couch. But still, there were a few sober people left in the house, and Marusia was one of them. I caught her gaze again. Nina shouted from another corner of the room, Grigory, you can go to bed in the guest room. Why should you go back to those horrible barracks, when I can make a bed for you here and you'll sleep fine? Well, I thought, that would get rid of Marusia's pestering, but what about Nina herself? But then Marusia called out, Grigory, aren't you going to walk the young girl home? After all, it's already dark, and what if one of the drunken soldiers will attack me? If you do not go, it will not be good. I looked at Nina, and she nodded. Then I said, let's go. We walked back at a leisurely pace through an alley flooded with moonlight. There were no lights on because of the danger of air raids, but we didn't need them on this night. 
it was almost as bright as daylight. We reached the women's dormitory next to the mess hall and stopped at one of the doors. It was unlocked and Marussia tried to drag me inside. The vodka gave me courage and I said, Not tonight, dear. You see, I'm Kalosha's guest and I wouldn't want to offend him. She put her arms around my neck, trying to press her lips against mine. She was eating onions and so her breath was unpleasant to me. I still kissed her, but at that moment I thought of Nina and the fact that if I had stayed with her, she would probably have hit on me too. But then I remembered that fleeting kiss this afternoon, and I immediately wanted to go back. No matter how hard Marussia tried, she still wouldn't arouse such emotions in me. After about five minutes, she let me go, adding, But don't forget, Grigory, you're mine. Of course, Marussia. You know that I would rather stay with you than come back the same way again and to go to bed alone. But friends are friends, and you never know when you'll need their help next time. I was beginning to annoy myself. It seemed to me that Marussia could hardly digest my words. She kissed me lightly on the tip of my nose and said in a gentle voice, Good night, my sweet. Very slowly I wandered to Kalosha's house. I was aroused from everything that had happened and from the vodka I had drunk, and now I felt a growing passion for Nina. Surely it would not be five minutes before she realised that I was no Grigori. Maybe it was safer to stay with Marussia. At least she had nothing to compare it to, and she wouldn't realise any difference. I walked, stretching my steps more and more, winding circles around the alley, trying to make my route as long as possible and hoping in my heart that when I reached Nina, she would already be asleep. When I did arrive, it was half past four in the morning, and I found Nina all alone, sitting on a chair and smoking a cigarette. And you walked a long time, Grigori. It was not easy to get rid of her, I explained in an apologetic tone. Without saying anything else, she took me by the hand and led me to the other end of the house, to the guest room. There she lay down on the bed and held out her arms. But Nina, I protested uncertainly. What about the Major? Ah, Grigory, it would be great luck to see him at least at ten o'clock in the morning, but even at that time he will still be too drunk to come to his senses. So we have nothing to worry about. I shuddered like an aspen leaf, not so much because I really wanted to make love, having no idea how it happened, but because I had no idea how she had it with the real Kirillov. Should I jump on top of her, or lie down next to her, kiss her feet or start with her hands? There could have been a million ways he'd done it, and I hadn't even guessed at least one of them. Now I wished I'd never even read anything about it. I could use Willie's knowledge right now. Nervously, I lit a cigarette and sat on the edge of the bed, playing with her hair and wondering what I should do next. Ah, Grigory! she said, stretching her words. You haven't changed a bit. At eight o'clock in the morning I was awakened by the gentle touch of her lips. I almost jumped out of my own skin and then realised that I was lying completely naked and in horror pulled a woollen blanket over myself. Nina, seeing my embarrassment, laughed. Why are you so shy today, Grigory? This has never happened to you before. I thought about what to answer. Now we are grown up and everything has changed. It's been so long since we were children. Yes, Grigory, she said, leaning over and kissing me lovingly. I'll fry you some scrambled eggs with pork, and while you eat, I'll iron your uniform. What about Kalosha? Oh, don't worry. He'll be up in two hours at the earliest. I ate quickly and wrapped myself in a sheet, waiting for Nina to return my clothes. It seemed like hours had passed. The walls in the house were thin, and all sounds could be heard, and when footsteps sounded outside the door, I had no doubt at all that it was the Major, and when the door finally opened, I almost died, but it turned out to be only Nina, who came in with a wide smile and gave me my uniform. Then she kissed me again and disappeared into the kitchen. I got dressed in ten seconds, and together with the tray also went into the kitchen. She was already making breakfast for the Major, so I set the tray down and walked up behind her and kissed her behind her ear. I'm not a Major, just a senior lieutenant, so I'd better get back to my business. Will I see you again? Of course. 
She gave me another quick kiss, and I left. The cold air quickly cleared my mind and my thoughts came back to order. Nothing could happen before the appointed hour. So I knew there was nothing to worry about at the moment and nowhere to hurry. The only thing I was a little worried about was what the boys were doing. I hurried to the barracks. Willie was already hanging around the entrance, waiting for me. Your mistress kept you late, and we were getting worried. We thought something had happened to you. Those women are nothing but trouble. You don't have to worry about me. I know what I'm doing, I said importantly. Willie looked at me suspiciously, so I asked him to give me a detailed account of what he had done. I'd better show you. I think it's too long to tell. We worked like diggers all night, and don't think we didn't scold you, he grumbled. First, we got close to the fuel supplies, and that wasn't safe. We attracted too much attention, but we mined one big ship and three small ones. It's hard to imagine what an astonishing sight it will be when they blow up. Willie turned and pointed to the opposite end of the harbour. See those two ships? They're full of guns and now they're full of explosives. I nodded. They didn't train us for nothing, you know. We've become so familiar here that when we went on a mission, no one even paid attention to us. And Major Kalosha is a clever man. He provides all the conditions for excellent work, supplies everything we need, and thanks to him, we will not only destroy the harbour, we will tear the whole city to shreds. And, Willie chuckled, he'll give us free access to weapons and stores if we need them. The sentries at the gate were so used to our boys going back and forth that they simply saluted, uninterested in anything else. As we passed them, one shouted to me with a smile, Drop the cigarette. I, smiling good-naturedly in return, threw the cigarette, and meanwhile my gaze stopped on the slowly and heavily passing tanker. How do you think to get there? And who's going? See those three men? He pointed with his hand. Those are our guys, and they're out there digging with ropes. I knew what it meant. The wire in their hands looked like ordinary twine, yet they had developed a more reliable and effective method, an explosive device. Even a weak detonation would cause such a fire that there would be no trace of the tanker. Then the fire would spread to the shore, to another important object, and then to the ships at the dock filled with weapons. There will be a chain reaction, and at midnight the glow of the fire will be visible far and wide. As we passed by, we waved to the guys. Straight ahead of me I saw a small bay surrounded by crescent-shaped hills, but there were no fuel depots visible anywhere. Puzzled by this, I looked at Willie, but he only grinned, so I looked more closely. At first all I could see were mountains and trees, but as I got closer I could see grey-green camouflage nets covering everything. It was a sort of ceiling in the sky over the bay. Fantastic, I thought. The Russians knew exactly what they were doing. Even from airplanes flying over the bay, only the green covering would be visible, nothing more. I saw whole convoys of trucks going in and out of the area, their tanks filled with the liquid gold so precious to the equipment of both sides involved in this war. The thought that it all had to be destroyed hurt in itself. After all, all this wealth could have been so useful to the German army. This, I take it, is the main fuel supply? You're more right than ever, and that's where we're headed now. We approached the checkpoint. I had no idea what Willie was up to, but now was not a good time to ask, so I followed him through the gate without asking any more questions. The guard greeted us, and we returned the favour. How did you spend the night with that pretty girl you told me about yesterday? Willie asked him. It was fine, he answered. I'm just a little light-headed after last night. He made a grimace, as if to prove his point. Willie pointed at me. This is Senior Lieutenant Kirillov. He came from where there is no sea, from Vitebsk. He has never seen the sea before, so now he is absolutely delighted, isn't he, Grigory? That's right, I nodded. I can show you everything and explain if you don't understand. In general, I know these places like the back of my hand. That's great, Willie told him. I could tell him everything too, but you'd be better at it, of course. The guard nodded and we walked through. I knew Willie had a good brain, but I didn't realise it was that good. 
To him, working in a situation like this was child's play. We passed the fuel tanks and even climbed the steps leading upstairs. Willie pointed to the smoking chimneys. You know, if they hadn't been there, the gases accumulating inside would have gotten so dense that the tanks would have eventually exploded. I already knew what Willie was getting at, though he hadn't finished his sentence yet. You know those clockwork incendiary bombs we have? We have to put them through the vents. We should put them in one or two tanks. We don't want one big explosion. There should be a big cloud of smoke first, then the explosion, then the fire. The fire will engulf this whole part of the harbour. It'll be the most beautiful yet horrible thing we've ever done. Those who are here at that moment will not be envied, but they will not be helped. Who is assigned to this mission? Franzel. The guards are used to him. He's always looming in front of their noses and talks to them every day. He even gives them vodka, which he carries with him. Vasily, the one on duty now, has already become his best friend. Last night they went out and Vasily found him a girlfriend. And from what Franzel tells him, she's pretty good. He'll be mined this afternoon, in daylight. He'll set his watch for midnight. We can only hope that everything goes according to plan, and he must do his job as we've been taught. The top of an oil tank wasn't the best place to have this kind of conversation, but it was the safest area for the moment. Willie turned and pointed first to the inside of the hill and then to the other side of the bay. There's an ammunition ship sailing in from Sevastopol. See all those trucks going down the road along the shore? They're transporting combat ammunition to the depots in those woods. We went downstairs and saluted the guard and walked past the fuel depots toward the moving trucks. Willie winked at the driver of one of them as if nothing had happened. The truck slowed down and the door opened with a creak. It was all too easy and simple and I didn't even like it. I was weighed down by the feeling that if something suddenly went wrong, the boys, too relaxed, wouldn't be ready for it. But things went as they went. The Russians seemed to be doing us a favour. Where can I drop you off? the driver asked. The senior lieutenant and I want to see the ammunition depots. You water rats, he said as we got into the car. You find time for everything. I haven't had a minute in the last 24 hours to rest or drink a glass of vodka. I've been driving back and forth all day and night like a clockwork, and nobody's going to thank me for it. All you hear is, it's war, so no one has time to rest and that doesn't make it any easier. Then he smiled sullenly. It's better to be here than on the front line, though. We were close enough to the armories to see them clearly. Although the forest was thick, it wasn't enough to hide everything, so from tree to tree the Russians had stretched camouflage nets like giant tents, tightly camouflaging the entire area. Through the strong barbed wire fence I could see the reinforced guard posts, the soldiers moved continuously like pendulums, beating to the beat of a pendulum, and they were watched by additional sentries who were stationed near the barbed wire fence and stood a hundred metres apart. No one would be able to get through this double guard. Willie sensed my uneasiness and gave me a slight nudge in the side to ease of the tension. Not daring to even open my mouth, I continued to star, assessing the situation and still worried. Nevertheless, when we entered the Gazi, the guards asked out, What kind of weapons are you interested in? Anti-tank, the driver replied. Follow the signs. On the right side. The driver started the car again and we drove off, completely unguarded. Inside the territory resembled a separate city. Ammunition was in square blocks about 30 metres high and 100 metres or more wide. We drove among the warehouses without asking each other any questions and finally reached an anti-tank weapons storage area where a group of soldiers were waiting to unload the car. Without thinking, I climbed down and was on my way to explore the area. But Willie, unnoticed by the others, immediately grabbed my arm and literally forcefully stopped me. I didn't understand what made him grab me. The lieutenant in charge of unloading asked the driver, who are these two officers? Political officers from the harbour? The lieutenant's face became stern. 
Nobody liked the political officer. You could expect nothing but trouble from his men. Having calculated the situation, we immediately began to thank him for his hard work and good work, for what his men were doing for the Soviet Union. After our praise, he relaxed a bit, and his attitude changed to almost friendly. Proudly showing us the ammunition depots, he said, Not only enough to deal with the Germans here, but we'll add more afterward when we chase the rest of them to Berlin. You're a fool, I thought. Even if we didn't succeed in blowing you up tonight, you couldn't last more than an hour with the weapons you have in reserve. But aloud I marvelled, playing it straight. The Russian army is a piece of cake, and the Germans will suffer the same fate as Napoleon. The truck was unloaded, and we, telling the lieutenant that we would be glad to see each other again, got into the car. He replied that he was always ready to serve his fatherland, but we knew that in his heart he would rather kill us than see us here again. In the empty truck we drove back to the harbour. As we neared the barracks, the driver slowed down and we jumped off. All this time I'd been dying to know why Willie had dragged me to the warehouses, and as soon as it was just the two of us, I stopped him and asked him a question. It won't be as easy as it looks, he said, reading my mind. Our little bombs can act like flea bites. You see, none of the bombs have warheads. So while you were out all last night, don't think I say this as a reproach, for I know you had to go. I sniffed out the situation, taking a couple of guys with me. We watched the ammo being unloaded, but I still didn't understand it then, so I had to watch all last night. That's why I took you out there this morning, to see how easy it is to get in. We thought the hardest part was getting into that area, but that's not really the hard part. Anyway, you can't set a bomb to blow up an entire warehouse at once. It's just not possible. Angry at that last sentence, I interrupted him. I didn't think you were so stupid. Nothing is impossible. All right, he said softly. Maybe you have a suggestion on how to make things work. Looking at him without blinking, I thought hard for a few minutes and finally accepted the rightness of his words. I'm sorry, Willie. You're right. We just don't have the ability to do everything we need to do there and still be undetected. Willie said with a happy smile on his face. Don't worry, Georg. I didn't wast the night. Next to the big Ammunition ship there is another smaller one. You can't really call it a ship. It's the size of a night pot, but do you know what I saw when they unloaded it? You wouldn't believe it. At first I thought it was salt, but the whole load in the kegs was so tightly and carefully corked that I realised that regular salt wouldn't have been shipped that way. Willie, stop trying my patience. Tell me what's in it, I asked curiously. He laughed again and stared at me fixedly. Raw nitroglycerin, white as flour. Remember, we were shown this kind of explosive back at the academy. We used to supply it to Japan. It's nitroglycerin in its raw form. There's some other stuff, I forget what it's called. I quickly went over his words in my mind. You mean the stuff that was in the bags? Yes. But what I can't figure out is, how does that make the situation go away? He looked at me again, but now he was serious. I'd better explain it to you in order, from the beginning. After we found the raw materials, we found the dumbest driver we could find. I mean, really dumb. It was about half past five in the morning. One of the guys unscrewed a valve to let the tyre slowly deflate. When the driver reached a dark spot on the dock, one of us stopped him and pointed to the tyre. He had already been driving on a flat tyre for about five minutes, but I tell you, he was too dumb to guess, and look, He'd rather blow up than get off and change the tyre. Still, he had to get out and go around the back of the car to get the spare off, and by then we had already gotten ahead of him and removed the tyre. Then he started cursing so much that I think his mum and dad at home jumped up and down. Well, I'll tell you, it was an invaluable experience for me. My vocabulary was greatly enriched. Then I went up to him and asked him what the problem was, he very confusingly explained that he had lost his spare tyre somewhere. I advised him to move the truck to the side of the road, closer to the buildings so as not to block the road and not to interfere with other cars, but in fact the fact that the truck was in a dark place was for our convenience. In any case, all the passing trucks were driving with their headlights on, so after pulling a little to the side, 
our truck was in pitch darkness. I then told him that a couple of my men would take care of finding a spare tire, maybe even bring it to the barracks, and advised him to go that way. As soon as he disappeared around the corner, the boys and I opened the cylinder, poured some gunpowder in the middle, and we still had time to stuff another one. Of course, when the driver came to the barracks and told us everything, the guys drugged him with vodka, telling him not to pay attention to me, as I had been considered an idiot since school. Anyway, they handed him a spare and he went back to his car happy and satisfied. I guarantee that even with a stethoscope you would never have heard the clock ticking. We did such a good job. Have you seen that tall building at the Ammo Depot? It's still covered with a big greenish-coloured tarp. That's where they're stored. I'm dying to know what's in there. You see, the whole warehouse is ticking our clock right now, and when the time is right, the whole town will split in two. As I looked at Willie, I marvelled once again at his genius. You're a wizard, what can I say? I doubt very much I could do the same thing. Wait, we have to wait for the result, he said. Do you have your pass with you? Yes. Then let's go to the communications centre. The guards at the gate didn't even check us, since they already knew us well and were sure we were harmless. I still couldn't get used to such negligence and only returned my greeting to theirs. I thought I would have to hurry up to take care of setting the mines, but Willie, as it turned out, had already handled everything himself. I was still impressed by his story, and feeling his eyes on me, I realised he had something else to say, but what, I had no idea. Finally he smiled and spoke. Georg, how are things with you and Marussia? I hope my advice was useful to you. You know, Willie, I think you've had more success this night than I have with Marussia. Well, Georg, I wonder if you've put the theory into practice. Well, I'll tell you. You know, it's not at all like they say in the books. First of all, she took the initiative, first to hold my hand and first to say hello. She was even the first one to hug me. I didn't have to do anything on my own. After half an hour, as you said, she got used to me and put my hand on her waist, and then, stopping, looked at me passionately and spoke. Grigory, I cannot resist you. I love, adore you, you are my life. You are so different from others. You are a real man, and compared to you, they are children. She continued this conversation for two hours, and then she hung up on me all evening, so I couldn't get rid of her for hours. Really, I did. And when the evening was over, she even wanted to drag me to her room, but I went back to Kalosha's house. I didn't tell Willie anything about Nina. I didn't want him to know what had happened. If I had been in your shoes, I probably wouldn't have been able to resist going into Marusa's room. Yes, it's easy to talk now, but you probably wouldn't have done that. Georg, what does it look like? You know, kissing a woman? Only seriously. I smiled. Now it was my turn to give Willie advice. You should try it sometime, I told him. Then you'll find out for yourself what it's like. We approached the Russian army headquarters, housed in a three-story building with an imposing staircase leading up to the front door. This building was truly magnificent. A guard stood at each column and stared unblinkingly ahead of him. They change every two hours, Willie told me. They're really just decorations, but there are more serious officers inside than you think. How could a sabotage squad get in there? As easily and simply as we entered the harbour, they're a special unit for communications, communications and radio installations, aren't they? That's right. They've got orders and all the paperwork to enter the building unhindered, and no one dared to ask them questions, not even the political officer. As we were walking down the corridor, we met Lieutenant Schwartz approaching us. He saluted but did not stop, so we also did not slow our step, so as not to be seen as acquaintances, and not even a shadow of a hint that we knew each other perfectly well flashed on our faces. We knew where our contact was, so we could get the information we needed if necessary. Then we saw a few of our guys entering the room to our right, but we ignored them too, as they ignored us. These headquarters housed the dispatch centre as well as the main think tank of Odessa. After walking down a couple of long corridors and turning around, 
we found ourselves at the end of the building and saw in the courtyard opposite us another building, smaller in size and something resembling a factory. This is the centre where the main communication equipment is located. This is where Odessa communicates with Moscow and all other cities in Russia, Willie explained to me. Here all telephones and radio installations are connected to the centre. To destroy them means to destroy the whole mechanism. I nodded. I knew enough to understand what the guys were doing. They had complete freedom of action now, and if they wanted to, they could plant hundreds of bombs in basements, vents, and other places where they couldn't be detected. We heeded back down the hallways, down the stairs, past the guards, and out into the street. Willie then led me across the road and the square, and after walking about 200 metres, we found ourselves in a large park. A monument to Lenin, surrounded by flowers and trees, looked at us. On one of the benches sat our man. He was basking in the sun and reading Karl Marx. We walked over and sat down on the other edge of the bench, talking loudly to each other. It was not unusual for two officers and a sergeant to sit on the same bench, and any person passing by did not care what we were talking about. Then, without changing the position of his head, with the same expression on his face, Leo said, Everything is working out well. There is no interference. We can easily mine the centre building and headquarters any time we want. The time remains the same, Willie told him. We got up and leisurely departed. Now, said Willie, we need to go to the harbour and eat, and then we can go to check what our guys are doing. How far from Odessa are they? About 28 kilometres north, at the point where the road forks, the southbound road is the main road from Odessa to Sevastopol. There are two other roads, east and west. I knew the place he was talking about. I had the map in my eyes, which we were shown in the movie. A unit there would throw the Russian front into total chaos. You know, Georg, Willie continued, let's forget about the war for a while and go see what Marussia has prepared for us. By the way, do you think I can get a date with her? Try it and you'll find out for yourself. Don't worry, I will. We walked across the harbour and headed straight for the kitchen. As we got to the door, I stopped Willie and said to him, Well, Willie, come on. When you get to the window, give her a big smile. You're getting a little too bossy. Don't think you're the smartest. I have my own plans. We shook off the dust, walked in and went straight to the window. I conceded to Willie the right to go first. He smiled at Marusa, but she ignored him and looked over his shoulder, trying to meet my gaze. She held out her plate to Willie without even looking at him. He'd asked for gravy and was now staring disappointedly into the plate of borscht. He turned away, disgruntled, and walked away. Sweetie, I said, coming closer, I want borscht and gravy. How are you, sweetheart? she asked without moving from her seat. I hope you dreamed about me last night. Darling, I answered gravely, every minute spent without you is like an hour of terrible agony. I was so sorry I didn't stay with you last night. She sent me a kiss, went away and came back with double portions of borscht and gravy. Willie was ready to kill me out of anger. Did you say you didn't know anything about women? All this time you've been playing me for a fool. It happened by itself, I answered calmly. Georg, I love meat gravy. Could you go and get some more for me? Sure, just a moment. I went to the window again. Marussia, my princess, you see, I can't be without you for more than five minutes. Listen, could you give a refill for my friend, even though he doesn't deserve it? It's really good. She looked over to where Willie was sitting and, grinning, went to get a plate. And Willie turned red from head to toe like a tomato. After eating lunch, we went to see what the squadron that was in the harbour was doing. It had already struck two, and there was not much time left to wait. Only ten hours. It was useless to try to contact the number two squad that was operating out of the harbour. The guys were scattered in facilities outside the city, and their assignment to destroy fuel, weapons depots and food supplies was a completely independent operation. The same was true for squad number three, working on the telephone lines. Returning to the barracks, we found only one man left to give a report. All the others were practising outside. 
Franzel is on his way to the fuel tanks where he will be planting explosives. The rest of the guys will wait until five, maybe six o'clock to mine the icebreaker standing in the harbour, the tugboats, the tankers, and the two ships loaded with ammunition, he explained to us. Willie and I left the building to go to the others. Willie started the engine, and we slowly followed the columns of ammunition-laden trucks creeping toward the port. It would probably have been faster to walk. Just before we reached the gate, Major Kalosha showed up in his car and started waving and honking for us to stop. What if he was talking to the general and we were being led away? But even if he was, being surrounded by trucks, we were trapped and there was nothing left to do but pull over. The few seconds it took him to get to us were almost the most terrifying of my life. Grigori, he shouted. How are you? Willie and I breathed a sigh of relief at the same time. Fine, I answered. And you? It was great last night. I haven't had that much fun in a long time. I'm glad you liked it, he laughed. You know, I don't remember much after I danced on the table, and my legs feel like cotton tonight. That's not surprising. If I'd been doing the same thing, I probably wouldn't be able to walk right now. How are you doing? Not so good. Damn Germans stepped up their offensive last week. I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to land right here in the harbour. I've got orders to keep my men here, not letting them go anywhere and ready to attack at any minute. Of course, that doesn't apply to you and your group. Anyway, the general didn't mention you. Where are you headed? One of those damn secret inspections. Probably won't even make it back tonight. That's too bad. We could have had some fun tonight. He shook his head. Yeah, well, maybe some other time. And take the lieutenant with you too. We saluted and drove out of the harbour. Let's go and see what's going on at the substation first, Willie suggested. I think we've done a good job. The Russians won't even think about what awaits their main centre. First of all, they are preparing for attacks from the air, and nobody takes us into account. We entered the most densely populated area of Odessa. Most of Odessa's suburbs were filled with tall apartment buildings built for labourers, but now we were passing a place where there were private houses with their own gardens. Odessa itself was quite a modern city by Russian standards. Willie pulled up to a brick building that stood among the other houses and stopped the car. I realised that this must be the substation, surrounded by a garden and trees, which seemed absolutely ridiculous here. Why did you stand right in front of the main entrance? It's safe. There are three of our people already working inside. They're being explained how the communication system works. By the way, we'd rather stop here than wander around like a bunch of idiots. Remember, we're not in a city, but we have the advantage of having the highest ranking sergeant in this place. We got out of the car and walked confidently as if we were going home towards the building. At the entrance, some Russian specialist with an absent expression greeted us, and then we entered and disappeared behind the doors. When you get to places like this, it's wise not to ask too many questions, Willie whispered. You have to look like you're a hundred percent sure of what you're doing, otherwise they might get suspicious and ask us unnecessary questions. He led me down the hallway, and we found ourselves at one of the doors. It was a recreation room, and as we entered it, we were stunned as much as the people in it. In the centre of the room stood a table filled with glasses, plates of ham and other snacks. By the look of the people there one could tell that they had already drunk more than one bottle of vodka. At ease, Willie ordered. Go on. They looked obviously frightened, expecting at least some swearing, but the words that came out of Willie's mouth were simple. The senior lieutenant and I are from the communications squad, and we're just checking communications, so don't pay any attention to us. It's like we don't exist. They nodded and continued drinking. Among them were two of our guys. The third was missing. After leaving the building, we got into the car and drove to the end of the street. Then, turning right, Willie drove down the road about 200 metres and stopped again. There was a forest on our side and opposite stood the private houses of Odessa employees, very beautiful and well-maintained. Now we have to go into the forest, said Willie. Dropping the car, we walked a hundred metres. 
The forest smelled pleasantly of pine trees and damp earth. Moss grew everywhere, mixed with grass, which was covered with leaves that had recently fallen from the trees. And silence. Then we heard our contact whistling, and then we saw him emerge from the bushes. Any change of plans? No. Midnight, as arranged. What's the problem? I asked. He shook his head in the negative. Everything is calm. Without saying anything else, he disappeared again, and we turned back, got into the car, and drove in a southeastern direction, and on the road leading up, we met our next contact. A similar report followed. Everything was going according to plan. Then, on the same road, but already leading downwards, we were met by a third report, who said nothing new. The reports were beginning to become too monotonous, and our trip seemed to be a waste of time. Everything was going perfectly well everywhere. Now, without wasting time, the only thing to do was to leave the area, and so Willie headed northwest toward Germany, where our military police unit was located.